Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Nari McMahon, uh, Director of CRR UK, Centre for Right Relationship, which is the uh, OSC Organisation on Relationship Systems Coaching Training Provider for here in the UK. Um, this is a company based on uh, teaching people how to be in relationships. I'm here with my co-host, Dr. Dal Potty, who is a paediatric nephrologist consultant at Great Ormond Street Hospital uh, with a background in coaching and management. Uh, we are also here today with students at the beginning of their career. Um, and so I'm going to go to this Meg, Matt, Tan, Sophie, Elise, Sheila. Have I got everybody's name in? Me. And oh, Hi, oh. hi. <laughs> Welcome everybody. So um, I want the first time I came across the word relationship, uh, you know, we we're all wondering it's personal relationship. Why are we talking about that? But actually relate, we mean relationship in the broader definition, uh, which is a state of being connected with our work, another person, with nature, in any form of the interdependencies and the connections we have. Um, and you also heard me say that we are the center for right relationship, which means that there is a wrong relationship, but actually that's not how we look at it. Right relationship is that you are conscious and intentional in all your relationships. We don't see anything as right or wrong. It's just that you make conscious choices rather than unconscious choices. Uh, so we are talking about this because we know that relationships matter and relationship matter matters in the healthcare system and for medics. Would you say that's right, Dal? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the relationships we have with our patients, the relationship we have with our education, continuous learning, um, our colleagues, um, and then the government and um, the NHS in itself. So I think there's so many relationships we have to keep um, an eye on and so just really consider how we may be behaving ourselves in that relationship. So, uh what uh, what made you decide to study medicine and if this was something that you wanted to do from the time you were really little what made me choose medicine um academic probably the academic element um i really wanted to try to prove to myself that i could do it um, i was always a person who cared for people so um that was a um the care side of, um, of a, a career was something that's going to be important. And um, I guess no one in my family had been a medic. And so it was, it was, there was no personal challenge that actually, can I embrace the academia with that sense of care and really become a doctor? Um, and some people told me I couldn't be a doctor. So of course that motivated me further to want to be a doctor. So that was my, my stepping stone of medicine. Um, but we had a very different experience to what you guys have, I think, because you have now um, almost need to have some experience of medicine before you apply to medical school, whereas actually that was different when I was applying many, many years ago. It was all very much based on academia and um, your ability to learn medicine as opposed to perhaps your thoughts on care and medicine. What does NHS or healthcare look like? So I'd be curious to know what anyone else um, and why they chose medicine. Mr. Matt, I'd love to ask you why you chose medicine. Um, I, I actually partly quite a similar reason. I'd say it was that I was always kind of into science. I, I love the kind of the theory behind it. And then um, honestly, the show Scrubs, I really love the show. <laughs> um, so, 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 so then I got some more work experience and I, and I found I actually really did enjoy yeah, the profession. I kept them pursuing it, pursuing it from the time I was about maybe 16, maybe a bit later. And then now I'm here, Elise. Well, I think when I was younger, I wanted to be a lawyer because I really liked arguing and I thought that's what it was about. <laughs> <laughs> until I was like 16, I was like, lawyer, like I want to just, I want to argue and win. <laughs> and then I realized, like I actually really liked science. And so I was like, I decided my A-levels and I was like, okay, cool. Now what am I going to do? Um, so like, like you both kind of said, I did the work experience and like the moment, I don't know, the like at the end of the first day, I was just like, oh, I, I've got to do this. Like there's nothing, there's like nothing else. And I, I guess like all the reasons that you said, like, you know, I like to care for people, don't we all? Um, <laughs> and, you know, the science behind it was always so interesting. And I think once I had that idea in my head, um, I just thought there was nothing else. Like there was nothing else. I loved other subjects, but it was just, it just felt right. I don't, yeah. Uh, Tan, do you want to go? <laughs> of course. Um... I'm one of your typical 
oh, your dad's a surgeon. Oh, we have to like follow it. But I've always had the interest in science. And I think seeing my dad, even at like, at this stage to like constantly learn new techniques and new uh, things to follow up like guidelines. I find it quite interesting because like you never stop, you never stop learning. And that's like something I want to do. Like there shouldn't be like a stop to what you do. And alongside like with the work experiences, I did pathology, I did neuro, neurosurgery. And like there's a little niche in each um, specialty where like you have too much patient interaction or too little. And like, I want to find that in medicine or like where I fit in. Who would you like to ask that question? Uh, Meg? I think when I was, I think when I was 14, I broke my arm and I'd never been in a hospital or any kind of, other than like GP, I'd never really been in that kind of healthcare setting. And when I got there, I mean, I had a couple of operations and it was great. Like my experience of the NHS was really, really positive. And I think my dad said something to me like, oh, you could do this, you know, you could be a doctor. And I, was, I just never thought about it, it never really crossed my mind. And then as soon as, obviously at first I was like, no, no, I couldn't. <laughs> and then well, as soon as I sort of thought about all the aspects of what medicine, I, what I interpreted medicine to entail, I was like, actually, I really like science. I always really wanted to help people with my job. So actually, maybe it is something that I could look into. And then as soon as I sort of thought about it, I went and did as much work experience as I could to be sure that it was actually what I wanted to do. And from there, like every every time I went to hospital, every new bit of work experience I did, I was like, yeah, okay, this is definitely it. And then chose my A-levels off that and basically, yeah, I've got on the path to do medicine. Thank you. And uh, Sheila? So I think my, my reason is a little bit different. When I was a kid, I was that really annoying, hyperactive kid. Um, and I just like, spoke too much and people used to call me prime minister because so I told everybody that I wanted to be the Prime Minister, I was, I was a nightmare. But um, I don't know if you remember back in the day, they had those, it was NHS Direct, it was called, and they had books and you'd open it and there'd be like diagrams and pathways. And every time one of my parents or somebody was like, oh, I've got cold and my arm hurts, I'd like open it up. And the only thing that I used to do as a kid was just follow those like pathways and pretend to diagnose people. So I like, I pretty much, I think, knew that I wanted to go into that kind of problem solving aspect as a child. But then growing up, you realise that it's got a bit of everything in it. I mean, it's not just science. You've got some philosophy. You've got sociology in it. You've got ethics in it. And it's like such a nice kind of fusion of all these different subjects. And it's so, um, what's the word? Wholesome, kind of, I think. Um, so, yeah, I think that's interesting. Go on, Sophie Ross. Uh, hi. Hi. Um... Mine's a bit, mine's a bit, yeah, mine's a bit deep. Um, my, my brother, <laughs> my brother's got, um, <laughs> everyone's been like, oh my God, I love science. Um, mine's, um, my brother's got loads of special needs and difficulties and things. Um, everything ranging from like language disorders to ADHD and autism and everything. Um, and my parents got divorced quite when I was younger and my dad kind of struggled to handle my brother um so the kind of res not responsibility but it kind of went to me and i kind of just grew up being that other figure in henry's life and being the person that kind of helped handle him when he didn't even know how he was feeling and things like that and i think growing up with that i also enjoyed it to some extent and obviously he's my brother um so <laughs> it was um yeah and i think i kind of just from from there, I was always, I really want to do this. I want to keep with it. Like everyone else, you know, I had a huge passion for science and, you know, I kind of wanted to explore that a bit more. And then the, the whole aspect of medicine being kind of pushing you in terms of academia um, was something that I was interested in as well. So it kind of just mixed from there. So yeah, Neve. Um, <laughs> yeah, again, mine was more like family experience. So um, when I was younger, my brothers were in hospital quite a lot. And so I think for me, that was kind of like the first point where I was like, actually, I, I think I would quite like to do something where I'm helping people, at least in some way. Um, and I kind of went from wanting to be like a midwife or then I started to want to be in the police and things. But then as I got older and I kind of, it kind of fit that I enjoyed science again, like everyone else. Um, but yeah, it just made it um, that bit easier to then once I'd done kind of work experience as well, I felt like it all kind of fit together. 
Yeah, I know that you've all said science, uh, you know, Dale also has said science and helping people, but the smile that you all share is when you say that you've had this work experience and that, you know, that work experience was like, I remember Elise coming back. I was thinking, oh yeah, she's just going to do like one day and come back and go, no way. She was like, oh, she used to get up early, get, catch the bus, go to the hospital and come back with the same enthusiasm. And that's what I'm seeing on all of your faces. Just t- taking that step further, Neri, um, I guess I'm curious, what's the essence of your experience with the NHS or of healthcare when you first went into those work experiences? So, so what did you sort of, what sort of feeling or um, energy or vibe did you get when you went into those different environments? I like the fact, so I went in and I joined like a, when I went to the hospital, like an MAU team and like none of them knew each other. And one of them was like 20, one was well, like 25, one was 30, one was 40, one was 50, they're all at different levels of medicine. And then they all came together and like, they kind of, they knew each one, like even the consultant had like, they all valued each one of their experiences and then they worked together despite being, you know, such different people. It didn't matter. Um, and then they included me, which was also great. And I was like part of this little team whose like one goal was each patient just to make them better. And it didn't matter their experience, just anything they could bring to the table. They just, they did that and like respected each other's opinions and worked together. And the fact that they, they literally met the first day I came and the fact that they could just kind of do that and put everything aside and just work so well together. I was just, it was so nice. And I really like, like, I like having friends and like, talking to people anyway um so it's kind of like having friends like ha- just making friends with these people who, with like a common goal and it just yeah it was it was kind of fun yeah I had a similar experience I think I went into a theatre and um, watched the surgery which I was so lucky to do and it was amazing and it was in the same way especially in a surgical team when I was in the room there were lots of there were loads of different people and a lot more people than I thought would be there because you kind of think of like a surgeon then having had a surgery I was like well the surgeon used to I don't see anyone else because then I was under um and then just being in the room and seeing how many people there were and how everyone had their own role and each role was as important as the next and everyone had this sort of real like shared respect for each other and what they did and the surgeon you know couldn't do the job of the anaesthetist and the anaesthetist couldn't do the job of the you know everyone else and then to be able to see the sort of patients in the clinic and then see them in surgery and then you know saw them when they wake up and you can see this pathway of care they go through and you know they go from having a broken hand to having a hand that works and it's just it was just so satisfying to watch and you can just see how rewarding it is and you're having such like a direct effect on someone's life. Uh, Mine was mine was kind of similar to that I my first kind of week was in the coronary care unit and um, I remember the first time I saw a I want to say angiogram but I'm going to be really careful on my terminology here you know and, and the screen from when the I mean the guy came in with a major major heart attack um, and he came in and they kind of popped the wire through cleared out all their arteries and you saw the difference between the front and the back and I just stood there and I was like oh my god you've you've done all of this in the space of 15 minutes and you know it's gone from this to this and you haven't even opened him up I just it blew me away and it's so refreshing from all the things that you see in you know when you sit there in biology and as much as you love it you're not really interested in what's what kind of you know organelles a plant cell has and then you go and scan you're just like wow um and I think for me that that was when I was just like this is so cool and very similar to kind of Megan Elise's experience where you go in and you see there's you know, seven, eight people in this room and you think seven, eight, that's a lot. But, but you know, everyone's doing their each individual bit, whether it's the, the scrub nurse or whatever. Um, and everyone kind of just trusts each other. There's no checking. There's no, oh, have you done that? It's all just done. And everyone trusts that everyone's doing their job right. And I remember they said to me that I was allowed to put the patient's NHS number in the system. And I honestly was like, oh my God, I'm, I'm like in it. Um, and I just kind of saw myself, I was like, Sophie, you're plugging in a number. But I, it, was, it was about more than that, you know? It was about being, doing my part, just like everyone else in the room was. I mean, I love this, um, what we're getting is this relationship that's really starting to form, this emotional relationship, this sort of cognitive relationship you have with medicine, you know, and actually it's so real, isn't it? You're, you're part of somebody's, you're actually there being present in somebody's um, life and it's a really vulnerable time or important time in somebody's life and actually you can sort of feel that you can feel that you're 
you belong and you're important and this is this is adding value to somebody else's life and i think i'm sort of hearing that energy that sort of that um compassion that kindness that sort of but the science is there as well similar to these guys because everybody talked about a sense of community when i went i remember admiring the the nurses the consultants the junior doctors and their eagerness to teach and i think especially this was in medical school when we were, when we were going on our clinical visits they took so much time out their day just to sit down and teach you something i mean to show you how an ultrasound works to give you all of these interesting analogies i mean i remember being confused about blood pressure with that what's it called a sphingomometer i can't even yeah. say it and he took maybe an hour to teach me and my friend how to use it the techniques and tricks for it and it, it does mean a lot because it means that you kind of have this relationship with them where, where it's like you feel comfortable around them you know and i think that's so crucial especially for the future to be able to feel safe in that kind of environment my neck started a little differently because i ended up seeing a fetal autopsy so i saw the post of the entire procedure and it was just like a really emotional moment for me because mm -hmm. seeing them like it was like a two-month baby and it was just so emotional seeing them cut them up and like the respect and the way they did it, there was, it was just such an emotional moment. And I was like, wow, like, how would you, I just couldn't compare that level to like anything else I've seen before. So that was like the real moment for me. I'm just, it's just amazing how, um, I think you can just feel all that sort of humanity coming through from all of you. And actually the connection is with that humanity side of it. Um, that, you know, the reality of medicine and reality of people's health is is there everywhere to see but actually when you're sort of part of that journey it's 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 a real privilege and i, I can almost see that even as students or as observers you sort of sense that and you felt that i mean we ne we don't go to doctors because we're feeling great do we, <sighs> we go to doctors when we are so vulnerable um you know when we are uh, as you said our humanity age doesn't matter experience doesn't matter I mean, we had the prime minister going in and he almost, uh, you know, lost his life. So it's, it's where you are most vulnerable. The, the amount of trust, like someone comes in and puts in you, even if you're, like, you've just come out of medical school, even to us, like when we go in as like medical students who feel like we know nothing, they look, the, the patient looks as us like, as if we kind of have the answers and can help them. And like, to, to like to have that privilege you have to take that so, like so seriously and I think like we obviously in this time as well like we all feel that but it's it's like not something that you like take lightly I guess and to go into it the re like you have to be sure so yeah yeah you're definitely there for the highs and the lows yeah <laughs> it makes it such a special job Del, I don't know if you want to do because we talked about the relationship with education which is lifelong education and that's coming through, isn't it, yeah. everywhere, that actually, that, that as, as medical or clinical um, professionals, you have to be continuously learning. And that, that relationship with learning is something that you guys have experienced, but actually um, something you're in the middle of, right? So you're in your first year of medicine, and your learning journey has, or education journey has been interrupted by something like COVID. Um, well, how has that been for you? Like, so, you know, what have you learned about yourselves through that? Um, but, you know, actually COVID has now interrupted this, this plan that you set out and the university set out for you. Well, I remember getting an email. We were all in the lecture theatre and the medical school sent out an email to our phones. We were in the middle of a GI lecture and everybody got it at the same time. We opened it up and the medical school had said, congratulations, you've all passed first year. You've all proceeded onto stage two, and there was just like there was an uproar, and I think that was one of the happiest days of the year for me. And you know, for most people, right? So you've passed year one. Go, you know, go and relax, go and do what you want. But I think I can speak for myself and maybe a few others as well that I didn't want to just you know close my books and just have a nice relaxed summer. I still wanted to learn. I was still throwing myself into yeah. um, you know lots of COVID podcasts and following the news, I was still really, really interested. And even just keep catching up with my studies, preparing myself for the year to come. And I think that kind of shows you truly how interested and how dedicated you are to the course, which is really interesting. Um, but yeah, that, that, that came as a surprise to myself. And I think to people who know me as well. 
I, I felt a bit like kind of worried because I was like, okay, we've got, you know, a lot of responsibility and a lot of things like we have to know. It's not kind of, I guess for some courses it's like, oh, like you miss, you miss a like module or whatever. It's kind of not the end of the world. Um, but for us, it's like, oh, you know, if we, if we haven't learned about, you know, the, the GI tracks, like that, that's going to be an issue. Um, so I guess that's it's not an issue guys. Don't worry. As long as you know about the kidney, it's all that matters. <laughs> <laughs> Like we also don't have our studies, we don't have like our physical exams and things that I wasn't yeah. sure about that I knew I'd like spent ages practicing in preparation for that. Now I'm like, you know, I'm going into second year without that like that knowledge and that practice. Yeah. I guess I, like in some ways it has kind of made me worried, not what like yeah, like a bit nervous that I'm not gonna be like at the same level as people who would have been in my position last year. Um, but I'm I'm trying to stay on top of working and yeah, <laughs> doing my best to try and like. I guess combat that but there's only so much like we can do and I and I think we have to also like trust the medical school um that they will prepare us like sufficiently so yeah so there was this anxiety wasn't there that actually you may miss out on things that are essential for your career going further along the line that actually if they sort of cut corners or perhaps didn't assess as well as perhaps normally that how do I know that I'm good enough? There's, there is there's that anxiety there sometimes, isn't there? It's because this is so important to you and you want to do a good job for your patients. Yeah, definitely. I think also for me, I definitely felt like that in terms of, you know, this exam that's coming up. Um, I've kind of done my learning because I enjoy it as opposed to because I have to. Um, and, and I think also there's a part of me that thinks, you know, I'm going to go into second year, I'll go on an Eki visit and they'll ask me to do... A GI exam which we haven't actually been taught and I'll just kind of freeze and be like oh we actually haven't like we haven't done that um but I mean I, there's also a part of me that's incredibly thankful that this wasn't last year during RA levels or maybe yeah. in our fourth year of you know final medical exams because I think it'd be detrimental um much more than it would be after our first year essentially so I'm a mixture mm. I think it's definitely think, put a lot more of the sort of responsibility of learning onto us. More, and obviously it always is on, especially the nature of university, you're more responsible for your own learning than you were at school. But we have things like, you know, we have, you know, dissecting room sessions where we're learning the anatomy in person and we can't do that anymore. And we've got clinical skills sessions where, and that's a whole different way of learning. And that always helps consolidate. I remember we always, we always learn the anatomy in lectures and then we go into the DR and we're like, oh, well, that's, you know, if that makes sense, like now I can see it in, in person and it helps really consolidate your learning. So to not have the opportunity to, to do things like that, uh, I mean, you sort of think in the back of your head, like, am I going to know this as well as I would? Um, so it's definitely made me especially be like, right, I really do need to focus on this anatomy, you know, via a lecture and make sure I really know it for an exam because I don't have as many opportunities to learn it and go over it as I would if I was at university. And you'll all find that you have a very different preference in terms of what, how you learn. Like some people really like the books and um, learning on their own. Others really learn from the practical experience, meeting patients, you know, talking to other colleagues. So you'll all have, you know, you'll soon realize that there's something that you prefer, but you kind of need that balance, of course. But um, and that will trigger an anxiety or trigger some happiness for you, depending on what sort of style of learning you're exposed to. Um, but that can be really useful in this sort of journey, just knowing what's my learning preference and um, what am I avoiding, because we all avoid the things we don't like. Um, but that's also something to think about. And so just going back to what's been happening with the NHS, maybe we can explore, um, you know, everybody's relationship with the NHS. Yeah, I'm curious. What yeah. do people, what's, what, <laughs> at the moment, there's a lot of terminology in the NHS. Um, fighting the war, survivors, um, heroes. You know, this is some of the terminology that's being used. Um, key workers, um, you know, the words that are being used to describe us in, um, in the NHS um, is a very different set of words that were used perhaps when you guys were exploring whether you want to do medicine. Um, so how has that changed your relationship with the NHS, but also your relationship with um, your expectation of the NHS that you're going to be become members of, or you are members of now? I guess there's a, there are a few different feelings about it. Um, I think it's a little scary, like going in, because 
it, it makes you, or well, I guess like they, they, there's a bit of a glorification of like doctors and seeing like they have their heroes, you know, they're doing all these things. And obviously like amazing, like they're amazing, but it makes you kind of, I don't know, it just makes me, it's, it's, it's just a bit scary because I don't know if I can like be, I don't know, be a hero. Am I up to this challenge? Um, I think it's also a bit scary because it feels like that they're not that protected. The doctors don't seem that protected. And, you know, I don't know how true that is in reality, but um, a lot of things I've read about, you know, lack of PPE and all those things, um, it, it, I feel like it's a bit confusing because they're heroes, but then they're, they're not, uh, they're such heroes that they don't even need protection. They don't even need help, which I don't, I don't really understand. And then am I going into uh, like a, a kind of system that's not going to protect me like, I, I, that, I, I think that's a bit scary. Um, yeah, yeah, that's kind of my, my first thought. Um, yeah. And very valid. I mean, they're absolutely what um, some people are talking about at the moment is that hero worship. Um, that kind of puts a huge expectation of you as a professional. Um, but equally, if the results or outcomes aren't as patients one or um, are expecting then that can that fall can be very high i think probably um it's it again it is like it's quite worrying obviously that we didn't have the kind of protection that we thought we would for um our workers um and in a way when they're being kind of likened to like soldiers and being on the war front when in reality they didn't they didn't pick to have that kind of um, lifestyle especially with um, a lot of people who've had families and obviously that puts their family at risk and although I personally think the NHS is a good system um, theoretically and like um, I when I look at other country systems I do think that our system is better and that it is for everyone no matter kind of um, how much money they have or if they could afford to have the care um, but I think it has kind of this whole situation has kind of highlighted maybe the weaknesses in the system and what can be changed kind of going forward. I guess there's some balance coming through now, isn't there? Because when you guys went into medicine, it was really positive and, you know, really committed to doing this, but there's the other side of medicine that's really important to, to notice and, and also sort of appreciate because that is also the side of medicine that you've got to be in relationship with as well. Yeah, I think I have a mixed response in terms of encouraging and discouraging people from going into it as well. As a result of this? Yeah. So would you persuade people to go into it now? Would you still have the, how would you change the conversation you'd have with somebody who's in their sixth form saying, I want to apply for medicine? I mean, I'd, I'd kind of, I'd still say, I mean, it's so hard because everyone has their different reasons for going into medicine. Um, and I think m my reasons are still the same, regardless of COVID. But it's a it's a choice that you've got to make, knowing that you could potentially be put in that situation. If it's a, a risk you're kind of willing to take, then I'd still 100% go for it. Um, I mean, it wouldn't have deterred me from sixth form. It might have just encouraged me. I think especially because it was so unprecedented, like no one would have seen a global pandemic coming that even these the doctors who we all say they are heroes and obviously they are but they didn't again like you say like they didn't really choose they chose to be doctors and they chose to put themselves in that position but they obviously didn't really see a pandemic coming and none, none of us really did so it does it is quite um i don't know it is an interesting um predicament especially because we all i've always you know respected doctors because I wanted to be one and I've always had that perspective of them as, as heroes and as really impressive it's just quite but I've never I don't know like other than people who've who've had experiences in hospital it's not really something that the general public talk about as much as they are nowadays but there hasn't I've never really felt that you know no one's ever clapped for doctors before but now because there's a pandemic it's, it's changing public opinion which I think is obviously a good thing it's just bittersweet that this is what it took yeah. to, to have that response and also before anyone says anything but about becoming a hero because ultimately when you go to the doctor and you can't have a baby and the doctor helps you and you have a baby or you have a sick child and they get well or you're unwell 
there is an aspect of us that we do work worship you know it becomes you become the hero the doctors become the hero but now there's a public hero uh, perception i mean how how do you be in relationship with the hero knowing that you don't know the answers you know there's the ambiguity as well don't you i mean this is a question to all of you including you dal because you've had all these experience especially your area of speciality I think you have to maintain your own humility. You really do. I mean, the moment you think you know all the answers, that's the wrong starting point. So um, I think certainly what medicine taught me is that you don't often know the answers. Um, it's often a judgment call. It's often the shades of gray. There's no black and white answers often. And I think if you are always trying to learn, you're sort of open to that possibility that it may get it wrong. Um, and um, how am I going to protect myself if I get it wrong? How am I going to protect my patients if I get it wrong? There's that, that side of medicine that you've got to be really mindful of. But, you know, yes, we have good days, but we also have the not so good days. Um, and we need to prepare ourselves or certainly build coping mechanisms of how we sort of deal with good, both sides of medicine. You know, the ego can take over when we think we're so good. Um, but equally, the, um, the, uh, the, the critical voice in our head can also par paralyze us and, and take over us function as a doctor. So there's both elements where that's really important. Yeah, because, you know, when you're a hero, you can also be the villain. So yeah, um, a, a villain internally with yourself. So as you said, it's the not only is the external relationship, but you have to make relationship with you about um, who you are as a doctor and what that means. Um, and what's it like to have someone 40 years your senior who's in a really senior position thanking you and, and you know, saying, wow, you're amazing. Um, and what happens equally when things don't go the right way and whatever way, you know, people die. I mean, ultimately people die in hospitals, especially. You're always playing with the two realities, birth and death, people die. That's a happy note, isn't it? Shut all the doctors mm -hmm. up. <laughs> yeah. I mean, what I find quite interesting is that, I mean, now obviously we're out on the streets clapping for doctors at eight o'clock and it's brilliant. They're getting the recognition they deserve. And, you know, yes, they, they are working harder than they might have to if it wasn't the pandemic going on. But they've always been doing the same work. They've always wanted to be involved within the NHS in this level. They've always been this dedicated to their patients. And, you know, like Meg said, the awareness is only coming now and people are only realizing that now. So I guess, yeah, you know, that's great for the relationships between patients and doctors in the future. We, we have more appreciation, perhaps a, a little bit more respect, I, I mean, you know, but also negatively, yeah, they might ask a little bit too much of us that, you know, possibly as humans, we can't give. Yeah, I mean, pre previously to the the pandemic, you know, there's there's always the odd comment that someone makes. It says, "Oh, you know, the NHS is not run well. You know, it's underfunded. It's this, it's that," and it's so easy to criticise a system that you're not in charge of, you know, that you're not managing or you're not in. And I think the discrepancy between people's opinion of the NHS before and now, I think, are very different. Um, in terms of, you know, you won't hear someone down the street now talking slagging off the nhs now so yeah i think in terms of respect as well i definitely think that's changed but there's some truth isn't there so it's something we say everyone's right but partially so that's something we say in us quite a lot mm -hmm. um and there is some truth to the fact that the nhs probably could be run differently and there may be better ways of doing things so um you know, there's a constant tension in us that actually the loyalty to the NHS, the loyalty to our colleagues, the loyalty to our profession is there. How much are we then open to listening to some of the perhaps negative comments um, about our job, our profession, our actions, where there may be an element of truth to it. Um, and um, it's in the service of hopefully learning rather than blame. But that's an element of your of our lives that we sort of need to sort of try to really sort of incorporate into our everyday because that's this there's always an element of truth perhaps in some of those criticisms um and it's how we receive those and how we listen to those and respond to those that are quite important 
And those tensions will be there all the time. So you'll have tensions of, I want to be the best doctor, but actually want a weekend where I'm not working all weekend. So, you know, you're constantly going to have those tensions. And um, how do I personally deal with those tensions? Because those tensions are going to be present in our life. Um, and I think that's where we have to show some kindness to ourselves, saying, look, we can't be everything to everyone. But what do I want to be for myself? What kind of doctor do I want to be? Or what kind of life would I like? Um, and so we constantly talk about in medicine, be compassionate, kind and care for your patients. But what about that kind, compassionate care for yourself and your colleagues? And how much are we, are we thinking about that as well? So I think that's a really important one. And, you know, in this space, just in the short time we've spent with each other, we've had so many different opinions um, and some similarities of how people have exposed the experience to medicine, to COVID, to education, to life. Um, and that's our patients, right? So this is a big trauma for us at the moment, COVID. Um, but we hit our patients with traumas all the time. That's why they often come to see us. And we expect them to get on with it. And we, in some ways, expect them to react the same way. Um, a little bit like the textbook tells them they should be reacting, and they don't. Um, so the reality is, in some ways, just take a step back and think, how am I feeling? How are others feeling in this trauma? Because this is what our patients are hit with all the time and their lives are disrupted, their education gets put on hold, or their life gets put on hold. So these traumas are massive to us, and we're all in it together at the moment. But our patients are often dealing with this on their own, or in a in sort of some smaller proportion, but that's a reality for them. So hopefully one of the things that COVID can really be supportive um, in your learning is how do people react to trauma, and it is very variable. Um, and how can I show some kindness and some compassion in that space? Or how can I learn from my own sort of experience with it? Because then that will make me be better in forming relationships with my patients. And I think that's a really important one. Yeah, sorry, I thought what you just said was really interesting, but also like for me, like the way I've reacted to this, like having this space of time and not really having anything to do, I've, I've, I've found it really difficult. And like the element of uncertainty, I've, I like, through all my life I've always had like a goal and something to do and I know what's happening and that's I've realized like it's so important to me um and thinking and like I guess knowing about myself is useful but also like like you said I, I hadn't thought about the fact that for a lot of patients like their life basically gets put on hold and for they don't know how many months they, they're going to be in treatment they don't know how many months they're like and it's so uncertain and so like I guess experiencing that in some way will like allow all of us to like relate to like how they're feeling on some level yeah. um and yeah i guess i'm i'm like not grateful but like glad to at least experience that and yeah um we do have we could take a couple of more minutes what i want to do is obviously i'd love to have you on the call again but what questions do you have of uh, dal of me of each other how do you want to conclude this i just want one question to spit of right. A metaphor that describes your relationship with medicine. <laughs> that's right. That's a great checkout question. <laughs> Make sure we're still still awake and working. <laughs> well, I think I'd be I'd be really curious to know because actually we live in our sort of like you know one part of our brain which is all about cognitive and analysis. But what about that creative side? That you know, what's the metaphor that describes your relationship with medicine? I think mine would probably be mine would be kind of a, a parent with their child. I'd say um, because you know you obviously love it so much you love your child so much but you know there are times where you don't necessarily like your child um <laughs> nor do you <laughs> and um and you're kind of your your own being as well as being a parent so you're not just mum that is not your whole role in life um but it takes up a big part of that um so i think yeah that'd probably be mine thank you matt you started saying something um yeah, I was, I was going to say, it's kind of like climbing a mountain tied to 350 people. You're kind of like running up for five years and then you reach the top and you can you know, jump off with a parachute. <laughs> That's lovely. I love it. Mine's, mine's um, this is a bit fresh, but like you're on a speedboat 
and you're in the middle of the ocean and you can literally go wherever you want you can do whatever you want but if you lose concentration for one second and you fall off the boat you're like struggling to swim and that's the workload but other than that it's great fun <laughs> i love it love it beautiful metaphor <laughs> I'm procrastinating this idea, but uh, mine would be like a timetable for like for my entire life, and half of it's just shaded with medicine, just saying medicine on it. <laughs> <laughs> the other twenty-five percent is procrastination. <laughs> <laughs> a big question mark. Yeah. <laughs> I guess for me, um, if I have more time, then I would probably come up with something much better. But- <laughs> I was thinking like you know how snakes always shed their skin and I guess like because this is like a lifelong career and this is a decision we made when we were maybe 16 or even younger um the person that we come out of like medicine is going to be like hopefully a completely different person and even five years ten years time like each time we're going to change well I hope that we'll change and we'll grow so much and so like a snake we'll we'll be shedding our skin and changing (laughs) and um getting better so yeah (laughs) Lovely. Love, it. Love that. Yeah, it's brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> I think I always find that I think medicine really gives me like quite a purpose in life, like like a sort of path, you know, like the path of my life. I always I like to think that that's kind of the thread that's running through it is that at the heart of all that I do, the reasons that I want to do medicine are the same as the same things that I want to keep with me for my whole life. So it does really give me like a, like a common thread through my life and also something that allows me to meet so many other people who share the same same ideas I think going to medical school I'd never met so many people who think the same as me and just realizing that these people have the, the same inherent like beliefs as me and the same values was so nice and so to feel like we're all sort of on the same path but we can and also there's such variety we can all do different things with our lives but um yeah we all have this shared belief which is really nice I I think for me it's kind of like a kind of image of like the ocean in a way because it's so vast and there's so much and I think a lot of the time you think like oh I want to know it all but like there's so many parts that we don't know um, and we'll never know but I think it's also keeping the idea in your head like as long as your head's like above the water a bit then like you're okay you're doing fine um I actually had a GP say that to me once and she said like in medicine you're going to come across a lot of people who will pretend that they know everything and that they're fine but at the end of the day everyone's kind of on the same page as long as your head's above the water and you're doing okay and you're you're just passing you're fine that's all you need. Wonderful thank you so much thank you everybody and just know that if you need to get in touch with Dal I'll let if if it's okay with you Dal I'll uh, pass your details to Elise and then you guys can stay in conversation and uh, and yeah and learn from each other yeah Yeah. wonderful thank you very much thank Thank you so much for making the time really appreciate it thanks a lot Bye. bye thank you